Do you ever feel like you constantly forget things? I know in my household, my wife and I are both forgetters. Uh, admittedly, I forget much more than my wife does. She would blatantly tell you that. And I have a story about one time, we're, we're newlyweds, I've just been married eight months now, and for our wedding, she bought me something I've always wanted as a kid who's always worn glasses, and that is prescription sunglasses, right? Because us glasses-wearing people, we can't wear sunglasses, it's a real tragedy. And so, she got me these prescription sunglasses, and if you don't know, they're very expensive, about $200. And so she bought me these prescription sunglasses. We went on our honeymoon, tropical. It was wonderful. I wore them for about two weeks. And then I lost them. And I completely forgot where they were. I looked for weeks, and I could have swore I set them in one spot. I think somebody stole them. I don't want to accuse any of the staff members at Bridgepoint, but they're just gone. Okay, they're gone. I don't know where they went, but I can be prone to forget things. And I think that we all can be prone to forget things, right? It could be your car keys. It could be uh, where you parked your car. It could be a child. Or things could be a little more serious, right? You could forget something and it causes tension at work. Or something happens where you forget something in your family and and someone feels like they're not valued. Or even more importantly, we can forget things in our relationship with God and it can be devastating. We're in a series right now called Mind Game, and we're in the book of Numbers. We've been journeying through looking at different attitudes, and the attitudes, attitude today that we're going to look at, the one that we're going to address, the one that I believe if you get this attitude right, all the others can fall into place. It is the attitude of forgetfulness, and this attitude is so key because we want to be people who remember. We want to be people who remember what's important in our lives, what we value, what God has done. But just like the Israelites, we can be prone to forget, right? And the Israelites, they were people who forgot things all the time. We've been looking at this as we've been reading the book of Numbers, and you see that as they're journeying through the wilderness, right, they forget how good God is, and so they turn back to sin. They forget what he's done in their life, and so they want to go back to Egypt. And contrastly, They forget all the things that God has done, his goodness and his greatness in daily life. And so they just kind of wander around. And so for us today, we're going to look at the book of Numbers at an interesting uh, text. So this is going to be in Numbers 28 and 29. If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn there. This is uh, somewhat more of a complex text, so you definitely want to follow along. Jared always loves to give us those, right? And So we're in Numbers 28 through 29, and God knows we can be prone to forget. And so he gives us a remedy for that. And the remedy he gives us are rhythms or habits that we can follow that keep our hearts connected to him. Now, we all follow rhythms, or we all follow habits, right? Maybe it's a daily habit of reading or eating ice cream and watching Netflix, or it could be a daily habit or rhythm of checking the weather, or maybe on a weekly basis, you do your budget. Or for me and my wife, we attend the 5 p.m. service here at Bridgepoint, and that's a weekly rhythm for us. Or maybe on an annual basis, you go on vacation or you reassess your goals. But we all have rhythms in our life, right, that we follow. And these rhythms that we choose to practice, intentional or not, determine who we become. And that is both a good and terrifying reality because what rhythms we choose to practice can determine who we become. And so these things, these rhythms, God knows and he wants us to practice what is good and what is right. And so rhythms help us to remember God. Rhythms help us to remember God. And so God knew this. He knows that we can be prone to forget. And so he instituted rhythms all the way back in creation, right? He made days that are composed of minutes, which lead into hours and days and months and years. And there is a rhythm in creation. There's a rhythm to our daily lives, to our, to our lives throughout the years. And God gave Israel rhythms to help them remember him. And that's where we're at in the book of Numbers, that he gave 
his people rhythms to remember him. And so if you have a Bible and you're open to Numbers 28 and 29, you're going to see there's a bunch of headers, and it talks about different offerings that the people were supposed to offer to God. And then it goes into this list of annual celebrations or annual festivals that they were to celebrate, things like the Passover and the Festival of Tabernacles and so on and so forth. And so I'm not going to read all two chapters for you today. I know that really bums you out. But I do want to read just a little bit of this passage to give you a taste. And what it's doing here is it's giving a painstaking account of what sacrifices should be offered to God on a daily, monthly, uh, weekly basis, okay? So uh, it'll be up on the screen. This is Numbers 28, 1 through 8. It says this. It says, The Lord said to Moses, Give this command to the Israelites and say to them, Make sure that they present to me at the appointed time my food offerings as an aroma pleasing to me. Say to them, This is the food offering you are to present to the Lord, two lambs a year without defect as a regular burnt offering each day. Offer one lamb in the morning and the other at twilight, together with a grain offering of a tenth of an ephah of the finest flour mixed with a quarter of a hin of oil, about a liter, from pressed olives. And this is a regular burnt offering, uh, burnt offering instituted at Mount Sinai as a pleasing aroma a food offering presented to the Lord. And it goes on to talk about a drink offering and fermented drink and pour out and a grain offering. And all this is an aroma pleasing to the Lord. Sounds fun, doesn't it? Good thing that we don't have to do that today, right? And in a year, check this out, in a year, Israel would sacrifice 113 bulls. They would sacrifice 1,086 lambs to God. They would give over 2,000 pounds of flour and over 1,000 bottles of oil and wine. And they would sacrifice these to God. Now, that's a lot of offerings, right? I won't make any comments about the wine. That's a lot of offerings, right? And these offerings, luckily, we don't have to do them because Jesus has fulfilled that. But there's something significant here. These sacrifices were an act of God's grace for them because it helped to cover their sin so they could have a relationship with the God who loves them. It was an act, a tangible act that they did week, daily, weekly, so that they would connect their hearts to God, right? It was something that they had to sacrifice in response to God's great love for them. And it kept them in a constant rhythm, turning their attention to God. And so for us today, like we said, we don't have to do that, which is really good news. And God goes on and he lists these festivals that he wants his people to celebrate. And these are just annual celebrations that the people would celebrate. And we have annual celebrations here in America, right? We have the 4th of July, which helps us to remember our country. We have New Year's, which helps us to celebrate the new year and to look back at the past year. We have the Super Bowl, so the entire country remembers the New England Patriots, right? We have these annual celebrations that we do that are significant for us. And so we're going to look at the festivals of of Israel today, okay? And so good news, we don't have to practice these as, as Christians. So you might ask, why are we studying them? Well, they're in God's word. And if God told his people for thousands of years to celebrate this annual rhythm, because he wanted them to remember something specific, then I believe that's worth looking at because I believe that there are things that we need to remember about God that the festivals can teach us. Okay, so we're going to look at these festival by festival and they're super interesting. So the first festival we're going to look at is the Passover. And the Passover, this is in Numbers 28, and this was an annual celebration that God gave them, and the Israelites were slaves in Egypt for 400 years. And through a series of plagues, God sought to free the Israelites from Egypt, and after many refusals from Pharaoh, God finally had to make a big statement. And so he did something called the Passover. This is found in Exodus chapter 12, and this is when he killed all the firstborn sons of Egypt. And in order for the Israelites to be free from that, to, to not, for their firstborns to not die, 
that he instructed them to sacrifice an unblemished lamb and to put the blood on the doorposts so the angel of death would pass over them. And we can read this. This is Exodus chapter 12, verses 12 through 14. It says, On the same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be assigned for you on your houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day that you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. So he says, hey, I want you to celebrate the Passover year after year so you remember what I've done. And then soon after the first Passover happened, they fled Egypt. And so God wants them to remember that he's rescued them from slavery. And Jesus, what's so interesting is that Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he celebrated a meal with his followers, his closest friends. And that meal that he celebrated was Passover. And just like God rescued the Israelites from slavery, Jesus was foreshadowing what he would do with his followers. This is in John 13. I just want to read this really quickly. John 13, verse 1. It says, it was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, and he loved them to the end. And so Jesus' blood rescues us from, not from the slavery of Egypt, from, but from the slavery of sin, right? And his blood covers us so that even though we deserve death, God covers us with his own blood. We don't have to sacrifice a lamb because Jesus is the Passover lamb. And so every time that we take communion as a church, we are in fact celebrating the Passover, right? The fact that Jesus has rescued us. And that's what we need to remember from the Passover is we need to remember that God has rescued us. And think about that in your life. Isn't it just absolutely miraculous that the God of the universe has rescued you? He has rescued you. He has covered you. And so what we're going to do is, at the end of each festival, we're just going to take a moment to, to stop and to reflect. Because it would be really silly of me to say, hey, I want you to remember all this and not give you time to remember. And so in just a moment, we're going to take just a minute, and we're going to be silent. And I want you to just think about how God has rescued you. He's rescued you from your sin. Think about who you would be without him, how he has given himself for you, what he's rescued you from. And so maybe some of you, you're not really sure about Jesus or what this all means. And this is a great time just to stop and think, maybe who is this Jesus and what he has done for me. And so if you um, feel a little awkward in silences, it's okay. It's just going to be a minute. So it's not going to be that long. But our lives are so busy and so rushed, we hardly have space to actually stop and to reflect and to remember. So I hope that this is a good gift to give you space to stop and to think. And so take just a minute and think about and remember how God has rescued you. Okay, so that was Passover. Doing good so far? Okay, I know it's a lot of information. We're going to get to the next one, and this one is called the Festival of Weeks. 
okay, the festival of weeks. And what God told the Israelites is, hey, 50 days after Passover, I want you to celebrate this festival. It's called the festival of weeks. And this is found in Numbers 28 as well. And this was the festival that marked God's guidance for their life. They would remember how God had provided for them in the new crops of the year, because this was an agricultural society. So every year God would provide for them through crops. And then traditionally, this is the day that God gave the Israelites the Ten Commandments. And so this was the day where he gave them his instruction on how life works best and how to live. And this was a big deal for them. And so 50 days after, after Passover, traditionally, God gave the Ten Commandments. And so they would celebrate annually the Festival of Weeks. And this would help them to remember that God has guided them. So here's what's interesting. Is it just so happens that Israel, or that there's something specific for us that happened as Christians on the same day that the Festival of Weeks happened. And that is something that we call Pentecost. And this happens in Acts chapter 2. And on the same day that the Israelites were remembering how God gave them his word, the Holy Spirit came on the disciples in Jerusalem and they were able to spread God's message not just to Jews, but to every nation. It talks about how the disciples were speaking in tongues and everybody understood God's word for them. And so you can read that in the book of Acts. It's a really significant event, but it was God guiding them so that more and more people could know Jesus and could know his good news. And so this festival then wasn't just for the Jews, but it started happening more and more. And for us today, um, this is significant because this was God's plan all along, okay? This is uh, found in Ezekiel chapter 36. We read this just a couple weeks ago, and it's talking about God guiding us and giving us his word. It says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So God gives us his spirit and puts his word in our hearts today if we're followers of Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit every single day who can guide us and who can lead us. And so what we need to remember is that God has guided us God's guided us. He's guided you through life, through different trials in life, through different good times in life, that God is with you every single step of the way and that he has guided you. And think about this, that in a world where if everybody perfectly followed God's law, right, there would be no, word, no murder. The world would function very well. There would be no inequality. That The world would be just as God had always designed it to be, right? A world that is guided by him, a world that is completely his. And that's really good news. And so for us today, I want us to take a moment and I want, us, I want you to think about how God's guided you in your life, right? He's giving you wisdom when you felt like you didn't have any answers. He's giving you encouragement when you felt discouraged. He has led you to himself. There are many ways that God guides us every single day, and you can look back at past experiences and say, wow, I wasn't sure what to do in that season, but God guided me. And it is good for our hearts to remember that, to remember that God has guided us. So again, I'm just going to give you a minute to take time to think about that. Maybe uh, you want to journal about that on the notes uh, we give you, but just take a moment and to reflect on how God has guided you.
Okay. Are you guys up for one more? Okay. So this is going to be our last one. And this is called the Festival of Trumpets or the Day of Atonement. This is found in Numbers 29. Okay. And this was an annual festival that Jews celebrate. And actually Jewish communities still, still celebrate this today. They call it Rosh Hashanah. And Rosh Hashanah was something that they celebrate because it is the Jewish New Year, okay? And they would look back on the year, kind of like we do, and think about what they've done, and they would reflect specifically on their good deeds and on their bad deeds. And they would think about what good they've done and what bad they've done, and the hope is that their good deeds would outweigh their bad deeds, okay? And if their bad deeds outweighed their good deeds, they were worried about their name being in something called the book of life. And the book of life we see in the Bible, and it is the name that God has for the people who are going to get to live forever with him. And so if your, if your bad deeds were more than your good deeds, you would not end up in the book of life. And so this is very concerning, right, for the Jewish community. And so this is what would happen. They would, they would end that celebration, the festival of trumpets, with a specific day. And that's called the Day of Atonement, what Jewish communities call today Yom Kippur. And Yom Kippur was a day where the high priest would go into the tabernacle. It was the place where they worshipped. And it had uh, God's presence there. And, And the high priest would go into the center of their place of worship where God's presence dwelled. And he would sacrifice a lamb. And that lamb would cover the his, the lamb's blood would cover the sins of the people. And so even if their bad deeds outweigh their good deeds, they would be covered. And they could, their name could be in the book of life. And so here's what's interesting, is that in the book of Hebrews, Jesus is called our high priest. And it says that we no longer have to have a day of atonement because Jesus has fulfilled that. So this is um, Hebrews Chapter 9, verse 7, and then verse 11 through 12. Listen to this. This is so powerful. It talks about what the high priest used to do. He said, but only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself, and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. Then it goes on. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, that is not made with human hands, that is to say, is not part of our creation. And then it says, He did not enter by means of the blood of goats or calves, but he entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. And that eternal redemption means that he has forgiven us once and for, for all forever. And we need to remember that God has forgiven us. This is so key. That in our daily lives, we need to remember that God has forgiven us because we have sins. And I know for me, my sins outweigh my good deeds any day of the week. And yet Jesus is the one who willingly sacrificed himself for us. And if we forget that we have been forgiven by God, that is when people start questioning the goodness of God That is when we forget our identity in Christ. That's when self-hatred can ensue because we are so bogged down by our sin. But Jesus has completely forgiven us once and for all because of his work on the cross. And so we're going to enter into a time of communion. And this is one of the ways we celebrate that rhythm every single week is that God has forgiven us through the blood of his son once and for all. So I'm going to invite everyone to go ahead and stand up and we're going to sing a song. And during this song, may it be a time of reflection just like before that you can remember that God has forgiven you once and for all, no matter what you've done, no matter how far you've been from God, that he wants to forgive you through his son, Jesus. So the ushers are going to come forward and pass trays Hold on to the cups until uh, after the song and we're going to take communion together. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you 
that you have given us so much to remember. You've done so many good things in our life and you have worked for our good and for your glory. God, thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for doing everything that we need through Jesus. Help us to worship him and to remember him always. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Okay, so we looked at the festival of, festivals of Israel, right? And the things that God told them to remember. But what does that actually look like in our day-to-day lives? So that was kind of big picture. And so now I'm just going to take a few moments, not as long as last time, I promise, and talk about what rhythms we need to practice in our daily lives to connect to God. Because we can look at the festivals he taught his people, but what does that actually look out look like today? And so We need to practice rhythms in order to remember God. That's the big idea for today is we need to practice rhythms in our lives to remember God. And again, God gave us a map of rhythms to follow. This isn't just something we have to figure out on our own because he wants us to stay in proximity and intimacy to him. And so what rhythms can we practice to do that? And each week, um, we've been talking about a different mind game, right, that, that we can get caught in. And the mind game for this week is believing that we can be close to God without following his rhythms. There are people who believe that they can just do uh, whatever they want. They can just show up every once in a while. They can just do this thing every once in a while, and they can stay close to God. But God says that we need to practice these certain rhythms in order to stay close to To him, it's kind of like an awkward dancer who's out of step with the rhythm of the song. It's kind of like me at weddings dancing, right? I'm either that white guy that's awkward on the dance floor, or I'm that white guy that's awkward next to the dance floor, too scared to dance, and that I just have a hard time staying in rhythm. Well, I thought that would be funnier. Maybe you feel sad for me, (laughs) but it's true. So. Uh, One of my favorite authors, his name is Dallas Willard. He wrote a book called The Spirit of the Disciplines. It's one of my favorite books of all time, changed my faith. He says this, he says, a baseball player who expects to excel in the game without adequate exercise of his body is no more ridiculous than the Christian who hopes to be able to act in a manner of Christ when put to the test without the appropriate exercise of in godly living. So we need to practice rhythms. And so a few, I'm going to list out some rhythms for us, okay, that I think would be good for us to practice. But I'm going to just give three qualifiers really quickly, okay? The first one is that this list is not exhaustive by any means. Number two is that these are best practices, not legalism. And what I mean by that is we practice these disciplines in order to stay close to God because of what he's done for us out of love. We never do these to earn righteousness, right? And then the third thing I would say is that this is not about perfection. This is about progress. So I'm about to give you a list. And what happens when preachers give people's lists is that they can start feeling guilty. And that's not the goal, right? Because none of us have this figured out. But I believe we can all take one step closer to Jesus in living according to his rhythms, okay? So first thing is that we need a daily rhythm of spending time with God. That's absolutely essential. We need a daily rhythm of spending time with God because we grow close to the people we spend the most time with, right? And so we can spend time with God by talking to him in prayer. So we can talk to God anytime that we want, not just in this building, but any day of the week, at any moment, you can talk to God. You can talk to him about what is going well. You can talk to him about your hurts or your heartaches. You can ask him questions, but the people of God are marked by a rhythm of talking with him on a daily basis. And this is absolutely essential for our relationship with God. And if you've never prayed on your own, there's not a script you have to follow. You just talk to God just like you're talking to anyone else. And God always hears our prayers. We can spend time with God daily by spending time in his word, right? That his word is living and active. We believe we use it to determine what is true and what is not true, and it's absolutely essential that we're in God's word if we're seeking to be close to him. And that's a rhythm that we have in our life. And so if you're not sure, if you've never really dived into the Bible, we provide guides with almost every single series that gives you scriptures that you can read on your own. 
You can download the Bible app, which has Bible reading plans. But if you're not spending time in God's word on your own, not just listening to a sermon, but spending time in your Bible, I would encourage you to do that because God's people need a rhythm of spending time with him. And you can also memorize God's word. If you're reading it on a regular basis, and maybe your next step is to memorize it. So it's not just on a page, but it's in your heart, right? So we need a daily rhythm of spending time with him. We also, we need a weekly rhythm of worshiping God. And what I mean by that is moments throughout our week where we're turning our attention to the God who loves us and the God that saves us and the God that we love, who is our true center of our lives and our true center of our worship, right? Because you can't just go on about your own rhythms throughout the week. We need rhythms so we can turn our attention to God. So some of these are pretty obvious, right? We need to gather with God's people like we're doing right now. This helps us to worship him as we turn our attention to him through singing and through hearing his word and through communion and through generosity. These turn our hearts to God to worship to him. Also, I would say that we can worship God throughout the week by joining a small group. The small groups are those moments where we're with community, with other people, we're diving into God's word, and we're encouraging one another. We can love one another just like the Bible talks about. And that when we have a weekly rhythm of spending time with God's people, that turns our attention to God, and it helps us to stay close to him because you cannot follow Jesus alone. I cannot emphasize that enough. And then on a weekly basis, also the Bible talks about this thing, called Sabbath. It's this practice that God's people have been practicing for thousands of years. We don't talk about it much, but Sabbath is just a day of rest where you focus your attention on God. It's about stopping. It's about delighting. It's about resting, and it's very countercultural, extremely countercultural to take a day to rest. It doesn't mean that you're just on your knees praying all day. It just means you take a day to stop and focus your attention on God, and I believe wholeheartedly that either busyness, because our culture is so busy, right? It'll either eliminate our relationship with Jesus. Busyness will choke out our relationship with Jesus, or Jesus will choke out the busyness in our lives. So we need a weekly rhythm of stopping to remember him. And then finally, okay, so daily, weekly, and we need annual seasons to remember specific actions and attributes of God. Say, what do you mean? So at Bridgepoint, we mainly practice two of these. The First one is Advent, right? These are the weeks leading up to Christmas, and we turn our attention to the birth of Christ and the light that has come into the world. It's good for us as a people to have a rhythm of every single year looking at the birth of Jesus, right? It's one of my favorite seasons of the year. And we're about to enter the other season, and that season is called Lent. And Lent are the weeks that lead up to Easter, and while Advent has a more lighthearted tone, Lent has a more somber tone, right? It's this time of year where we look to the cross of Jesus and and how he has sacrificed so greatly for us. And then on Easter, we look at the resurrection and how he has brought us new life. And every year we look at this rhythm, we practice this as a church so we can stay focused on Jesus. And so last year we did this for the first time. We We did day one, and we did 40 days through the Gospel of John. And this year, we're doing it again. So every week of the new series coming up in two weeks, through the season of Lent, we're going to be providing Lent guides where you can dive into God's Word. And we're actually going to practice fasting as a church. You'll hear more about that later. But for us, every week, to turn our attention to God as a people. And Lent is something that we do Uh, Not because we have to, but because we get to turn our attention to God. And just like last year, we practiced day one. This year, we'll have the first day of Lent again, where you can come into Bridgepoint on Wednesday, March 6th, and you will have a self-guided worship experience where you can start Lent by focusing your heart on God. That'll be from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. on Wednesday, March 6th. You can come into Bridgepoint anytime that day, so you can start Lent with your church. And so today, as we've been talking about rhythms and remembering, I would just encourage you, what is one thing that you can do to follow the rhythms of God, to stay in intimacy and proximity to him so that you don't forget? 
Because even when we practice these rhythms, I don't know about you, but it's so easy to forget God in my daily life, in my life as I, it's busy and as we go through it. And so what's one rhythm that you're not practicing that you could do to stay close to God? And I hope you've seen the beauty and the power that rhythms have in our life to help connect us to God. So if you go ahead and stand with me, we're going to read a prayer together. And this is how we've been ending every message of this series because we believe prayer is truly what changes our hearts. So if you would read this prayer with me, it says, hold on, there we go. It says, Jesus, my heart easily forgets who you are and what you have done for me. Help me to remember you every day through the rhythms you've given us. In the power of Jesus' name, amen.